Okay, hello, hello everybody. Um, my name's Gordon, Gordon Banner, um, and hopefully you're here to learn about NoSQL. Um, just in case, that, uh, before we sort of really get started properly, um, I was just sort of wondering, uh, you know, do the sort of audience survey thing, um, uh, who here has actually just about heard of NoSQL? That's good. Is anyone actually using one or other of the NoSQL databases out there? Okay, so we've got some people in here to trip me up on the uh, details as well. Uh, is anyone here actually know everything about all of it and they're just here to check out whether I'm any good? Good, no, that's fine, well, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> and if anyone here hasn't heard of it at all, well, you'll certainly know about it by the end. Um, so, what this talk is, is, is a very high level survey, it, it is whoosh right through, trying to cover a wide variety, there's a lot of different NoSQL databases out there at the moment, uh, so I'm not going to be drilling in, in great depth to any one particular database. Um, the, you know, that, that's, there's plenty of room to talk about each one individually, so there just isn't time. Uh, but hopefully, if you've just been hearing the buzz, uh, or maybe someone's brought in Couch or recommended that you use Mongo or whatever it is, and you're going, uh, yeah, whatever, um, then this, hopefully you should come out at the end of this with a bit more idea of the overall scene and what's going on. So, um, we're going to talk about what is NoSQL and why, uh, the different varieties of those databases and then sort of general wrap up. I hope, hopefully, um, right, that's a bit more visible. So, what is NoSQL? Well, it started off as being NoSQL, but the sort of politi politically correct version is not only SQL, because the, the point of this is that people are saying, we've, we've been using one-size-fits-all data stores uh, since the 1970s, everything's been going relational. Uh, you're not even allowed a choice. Your corporate IT department says all our databases, all our data is Oracle or whatever, um, and there's no choice. So the point of this movement is there are other alternatives, there are choices. One of those choices is still relational. So it's not only SQL, or perhaps not only relational would be a better translation. Um, and this is sort of, it's mostly coming from the sort of world of uh, large scale web applications. Facebook, Google, Amazon are names that you hear coming up over and over again. Twitter, uh, people who, they're developing relatively new applications, so they're not interested in legacy compatibility. They've got to deal with huge scale. Um, they want to run on commodity hardware, uh, and they want to just be able to scale out, distribute around the world if necessary, um, and denormalized. Well, that's perhaps the first word that would scare your traditional database administrator in this, uh, that, that things start, it, stop, it stops looking like what you were taught in second year university about good database design because people want performance, so let's start denormalizing, and we'll see a lot more of that. Uh, the other thing this is aimed at is your brain and mine. The, the relational database, tables, columns, whatever, uh, is not that complicated a model, but it can get complicated, particularly when you're trying to shoehorn in concepts that don't really fit in a rectangular table. Um, so, a lot of the, the solutions are growing out of what developers really want. They want to be able to store an object. They want to be able to store a hash or uh, you know, whatever structure they've got. And so these are aimed to be much more brain friendly. Um, the common sort of characteristics, again, this is a big general, I'm making a lot of generalizations across a lot of products and a lot of different categories and niches. So, this isn't true for every product everywhere, but you will see, generally speaking, they're aiming for distributed servers and storage. Um, consistency, as you expect it in your relational database, is often sacrificed for performance and so on, so you think about eventual consistency. Sooner or later, it'll come together. Um, simpler data models and the schema is usually a flexible arrangement. Um, 
server-side processing is an entirely different philosophy to what it is with stored procedures and we must encapsulate all the business logic in the database. Um, so it maybe gives you the opportunity to run MapReduce style functions over your database, but not necessarily to tie all your logic in. And there's a lot of, I originally wrote Hadoop concepts, but Hadoop itself is based on the Google white papers, things like Bigtable and so on. So fundamentally, these concepts that were developed at Google have come into Hadoop now. And you see things like that. MapReduce comes up in a lot of these, in a lot of these uh, products. So you will, if you look around at this space, there's a lot of um, JSON, JavaScript, and REST in particular, and some of these other things. Um, Java is kind of inevitable, I guess, these days. Uh, but there's a surprising number of them uh, support Erlang or are written in Erlang, for example. And that kind of reflects, this is the last two years worth of development, largely. The, the buzz has been building up really quite recently. And these are the buzzwordy technologies of today. No one wants to play with XML anymore. Uh, no, no one wants to be uh, sort of dealing with yesterday's language. So it's all kind of, um, you know, 2010, 2011 stuff. So why do we actually need this stuff? What's wrong with, what's wrong with your traditional relational? Um, warning. I, 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 have, I have lots of lovely database administrators for friends, and they're all lovely people. Um, but I have actually sort of sat there in conversations with them, and you just realize sometimes there's this mismatch where they're still they're still reading off that text you get in the second year of uni, like I said, where it says everything has to be third normal form and the logic, the business logic should be in the database because then it's a kind of safe place and, um, you know, a relational database is the only mathematically proven way to do it and, and this is not that stuff. So the biggest problem, I mean, we, we had the talk about continuous deployment yesterday and somebody asked the question, how do you do that with your database schema? The answer is, well, the answer in that case was, we don't, we use CouchDB. Um, and it is hard. It's, it's one of the hardest parts of doing a deployment of any piece of software. If you've got to change your relational schema alongside it, that, that can be, a, you know, it turns what was a normal deployment into a, right, we're going to need the weekend for this, everybody in, I want everybody's phone numbers, you've all got to be there at your desks, whatever. Uh, and a rollout plan that a rollback plan that takes eight hours, it, you, it's a serious block to some forms of development. Um, also, the traditional relational databases tend to scale up more naturally. Uh, I mean, I know Oracle and everyone will have partitioning schemes which work better or worse, but generally speaking, you see a lot of big databases are just run on very big hardware, and you know how many terabytes of primary RAM do you want, let alone um, uh, storage. Um, also, this coming back to the sort of brain thing, if you want nested structures, trees, yada, yada, you can do them with tables, but you're working against the, the way it's shaped. Um, and, okay, the joins can be a problem, but uh, the other thing is coming back to the what's in your brain, if you're working all day with a procedural mindset, yes, it's not impossible to learn uh, relational uh, concepts, but I think probably most developers are, yeah, yeah, whatever, uh, more than they like to admit. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of complexity if you really want to do it properly, and it's, you actually have to stop thinking procedural, start thinking about set theory, and so on and so on. Um, which is, as I think, is more of a problem than people perhaps like to admit. Uh, and you do end up then, when you're talking about stored procedures and stuff, how do you take that, you join it together, where you get Transact SQL or Oracle SQL, or what, you know, whatever these things are called, uh, which are half procedural and half not, and ugly. Um, the other reasons, a bit less, um, a, bit, a bit less validly, is that they're not this year's buzzword. Um, uh, you know, if you're talking cloud and woo and let's do something exciting, nobody thinks that rolling out DB2 is in that category. So, uh, <laughs> um, so the NoSQL solutions obviously try to fix a lot of these problems. 
I was just going to say more about the brain share thing. Look, these are three books by Joe Chelko, who's a respected and good commenter on SQL. Advanced SQL, thinking in sets, the, uh, uh, trees and hierarchies in SQL. That's that much on your bookshelf. It's about eight centimeters of your bookshelf gone. If you, if you don't want to spend your time reading eight centimeters of dense text, try another solution. Um, on the other hand, what's right with uh, the relational databases? They've been around for decades, so basically they're they're stable. You can bet your business on them. Um, there's decades of optimization and so on, and it, everybody does understand them to whatever extent. You know, no one will say, "Oh, I can't use a relational database. I don't know how it works." Um, it does also have it will have permissioning per user and so on. And you, I say, I don't like the embedded store procedure languages usually, but you can do it. Acid transactions, they're great for that. Um, and basically nothing that we're talking about today really replaces the relational database if you just, if you want to capture bank account movements, you know, the classic thing. Uh, a transactional stuff is where databases still rock. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I mean, so basically the NoSQL stuff has to catch up. If I just step back, I mean, they'd love to be optimized for decades and yada, yada, yada. But some of the stuff, they don't, they don't bother. Then, then we're not going to be seeing rich permissioning in NoSQL. It tends to be you've got access or you haven't, usually. Um, and, and the transactions, that's kind of a sacrifice that they've chosen to make. Um, partly because of this sort of f philosophical thing of relational databases were invented in the 70s, kind of all came together in the 80s, and they, ever since they've been ruling the roost, obviously. But those were the days when you had a, a fat client which talked to the database. And the less logic you could put in that client, like business rules and so on, the more you could put in the database, the better, because then you're taking care of your data and you've got that reassuring thing and you need the permissioning because you don't want just anyone on any machine to be able to connect to the database. In this new world, we're assuming it's, it's three-tier stuff. You've probably got an application server of some sort in front of the database um, and so you let that handle all the logins and, and is the user authorized to do this and stuff. Um, and uh, there's, there's less of a chains and bondage restriction on what you can do. Uh, the comparison I've seen is like, if you're in a static type language, you, you don't let yourself assign a string to an int. If you're in a, a, a dynamic one, like we all know Perl, you just have a test. You have a unit test that says, OK, I didn't assign any strings in there. Um, so unless you're trying to convince someone, like a regulator, that can be a problem, but otherwise, you just get on with it. So that's the background. Um, let's just talk about what varieties of NoSQL databases there are. These are the sort of currently fashionable categories. Um, key value stores, document stores, not column oriented and graph. Um, and we'll talk more about each of those. Uh, these are the ugly cousins. Um, navigational and this sort of stuff. This is mostly mainframe world pre-1980. Um, it, it was big, it was fast, and it worked, actually. And if you look at people like Adabase and so on now, they still have a huge footprint of data around the world. And they're not, certainly not SQL. They're certainly not relational. Um, but that's not part of this, so we don't talk about them. Um, Object-oriented databases, XML databases. Well, everyone was going to do that. What was that? Ten years ago, five years ago, um, and they never quite got the traction. Uh, um, I think with object-oriented ones, they were partly a bit too. They were a bit too close to your programming model. It was like, you know, so I put all these Java objects in there, but now I want to access it from Perl or Ruby, and then. You know, how do I get that? Because they're Java objects, not just generic objects. That sort of problem. Um, and of course, XML stores tried to map everything as XML structures. And the problem with them, of course, was that they tried to map everything as XML structures. Um, <laughs> and, and who wants that? Um, LDAP. There's a lot of LDAP out there. Okay, technically that's an access protocol, but 
there's a lot of data in stores that you don't access via an SQL interface. But anyway, that's, that's, that's all a bit last year. Um, so let's talk about these individual things. So the key value stores are actually quite old, an old concept, uh, Berkeley database. Berkeley database, sorry. Um, uh, and uh, yes, but I mean, they've been around for a long time. Uh, DBMs have, have uh, you know, been around. Again, that's, people don't tend to mention them in this company, but they are exactly the same stuff. Um, and it's very simple to model in Perl. I'm, I'm not going to give you a lot, lot of um, code in this presentation, but you know, it's, it's, it's like a hash. You've got a key, you pick up a value. Um, these other ones, memcached, you've probably heard of as a caching solution. There's a DB version of it, which basically just makes it persistent. Um, Rearch is basically key value. Um, actually, I've got a slide about it. It's it, um, slightly richer, and likewise, Redis. But if I click forward, OK, uh, Re Redis is a key value store, uh, which is quite widely used, I think. Um, it's often used as a cache p for pure speed. So you might actually team it up with your other database. It's, it's not your database of record. But you can make it um, save to disk and so forth if you want. You lose the, you lose the speed if you do. Um, and it's, although it's basically key lookup, and then you just get a lump of value back, you know, a, a value which could be anything as far as Redis is concerned, in f that's the high level view. In fact, Redis has a very rich set of operations. So if you make that value a string or a list or um, sorted lists, it, it's got various types of sets and things. Uh, and it's got a whole bunch of operations like push pop and so forth. And you, so you can actually end up using it as a, as a queue or as a publish subscribe solution as well. Um, it's not dedicated to any one of those things, but it's a handy Swiss Army knife of data management um, uh, options. Um, REARC. Sorry? Uh, publish, subscribe. Yeah, so, so basically that's, if you have a straightforward queue, maybe <coughs> your producer puts something in and your consumer takes them out. With publish, subscribe, you'll have one thing, producing messages and maybe a lot of clients that are all listening to the same, uh, to the same queue. Um, REARC, again, is just a key, key value thing in theory. And it's just, as far as it's concerned, the data is kind of just binary blobs. And you can put reasonably large chunks of stuff in there. But if you decide to make your blobs actually JSON, XML, or whatever, you can start hooking in with sort of Lucene style search. Uh, and it can also set up a metadata uh, information about those blobs, so links between values, um, which is as close as you're going to get to sort of relational style foreign key type references. You can say, go from here to that value and follow the links around. Um, document databases. Uh, this is probably the sort of stuff you've mostly heard about here. Um, so. It's a bit like a key value. Probably every doc, everything will just have a, a key, but you don't worry about it so much. What's in the value will actually be a document. This is not a Word document. It's a JSON or XML structured sort of data structure, um, which maps in, in Perl terms very nicely to nested hash arrays, what have you. Um, Mongo and Couch are perhaps the best known in this space and probably getting the widest adoption. Um, Mongo, actually, again, I've got slides on this, but, but uh, Mongo is um, a more, uh, it's slightly more close in mindset to your traditional database. It's um, a bit more transactional, a bit more consistent. By default, you can tune these things. And CouchDB is masterless, so you, you can quite easily generate conflicting information in CouchDB. Uh, which you then have to resolve manually. Um, but that's not necessarily a problem. Couchbase is, is like the proprietary plus plus on top of CouchDB. 
ravendb.net one, and I've added Elasticsearch since this morning's talk, um, uh, which was a good talk. If you missed it, then you can probably check it out on the video. Um, Elasticsearch is pretty similar to the other two, but it, it's absolutely built in with Lucene for searching on every possible attribute and full text type searching. Um, just in case anyone doesn't really know what JSON is, um, I won't linger on this, but basically it's JavaScript object not notation. It's a way of representing fairly generic data structures. Um, uh, maps onto uh, hashes and, and, and arrays in Perl very nicely. The only problem with it, at least as far as the Mongo guys is concerned, basically everything there is a string or a number. Um, Mongo, they've actually created a binary JSON, BSON, they call it, um, which allows much, a much wider selection of data types, like uh, uh, wide and double um, floating point numbers and, and this sort of stuff, uh, date types, and, and a bunch of others that escape me right now. But uh, so, so it, it basically looks like JSON, uh, but has a little bit more information. And actually, these are the two. They, I mean, uh, you can do a comparison of these. Probably, there's, for a lot of use cases, there's not all that much difference. And particularly if you tune them, if you took CouchDB and tuned it to look more like Mongo or vice versa, then you really do meet in the middle. But Couch, um, it's an Apache project. It deals with uh, plain old JSON, uh, HTTP, <laughs> interface, um, and as I say, it's masterless replica replication. So you can have lots and lots of databases, and one of the places they're currently sort of marketing it is if you want to write an application that works on your iPhone and your iPad and your home PC and then syncs up to the cloud, each one of those is like a little database. You put your changes in, and when they next connect up, they sync up. Um, and, and so there's no concept that when, when your phone is out of range, it stops working. It just keeps on storing the stuff and then syncs later. Um, but that does mean that inconsistency is possible. In theory, I could make some, a change on my phone and my colleague could make a change on their phone when it joins together. Couch's approach is basically, it will pick the latest by default and it, you can notify, get notified and then you have to go and sort it out. The, the real advice is write your application so that doesn't happen. Um, uh, you know, just structure the data. Uh, and they have the concept of couch apps, which are little um, HTML J JavaScript applications. You, you actually save them as documents in the data store. And then uh, a, a user in a web browser or whatever can actually connect, and they kind of get the application out of the store. It's, it's kind of a neat feature. It might be a bit gimmicky if you all you want to do is store lots of data. but you know, it's their little selling point. Mongo, as I said, is closer to what your DBA would be happy with. It's much more likely to uh, keep consistency and so forth. Um, they, they, actually, I'll put replication there, but they all do partitioning and replication uh, as far as the eye can see. You know, you want, you, want to have, um, you want to have five copies of your data in six different data centers, whatever, go for it. Um, OK, let's move on. So as I haven't been to the, the, the talk this morning. Uh, I thought I'd better put in Elasticsearch. It looks quite cool, actually. Um, uh, but um, it, it's, it's based around Lucene, and it's based around searching. I think it's probably not as uh, good at distribution yet as, uh, as Mongo and Couch. They were saying yeah, uh, this morning that you kind of want to keep it all in one data center at the moment. but. I say, check out yesterday's, uh, this morning's talk. Uh, I don't want to uh, go on about something I don't know too much. Uh, Column-oriented types. So this is um, straight out of Big Table. Um, Google published their white paper. They didn't publish their source code or anything. So everyone's been running to try and do the same thing. Um, and the idea is you've got tables with lots and lots and lots of columns, like maybe millions. Um, most of which are not populated for most rows. So um, uh, it's 
and it's also actually oriented by towards the column. Let me let me come on to that. So this is the way the top diagram is the way you're often told to think about it. You've got a co column families, um, so uh, and within those you've got columns, and and most of those columns could be empty. And the column families are probably related types of data. And the classic example here um, seems to be, or at least it comes up every time, suppose you're Google, you're crawling web pages, uh, and, for, and your key might be a URL for a page. What you're interested in, in in column family in the first one would be all the pages it links out to. And so your headings would be URLs for other pages. How many URLs are there on the internet? Quite a lot the vast majority of pages are not going to have links to most of those page, to, to all those other pages, if you see what I mean. There'll be a, a million lines or columns across the top, and you've got links to two of them. And then in the same, in the next column family along, you'd have links incoming. And so every page that you've ever scanned has it linked to this page we're talking about here. In most cases, probably not. So you end up with something with a million columns and a million columns, and three of them are populated in each case. So I prefer to think of it uh, as more like you've got a, a sort of hash arrangement uh, here where uh, for, uh, for those columns which actually have a value, think of it as a hash mapping. And in fact, even better than that, this is the way it really works. I've taken that same example. Sorry, I meant to say that's, that's just the top two rows rewritten. Um, so with that same example, this is the way it's actually implemented, is you've got all these sort of hops to go through to look up the final value. Uh, those are all like sub keys within, uh, you know, one, one after the other to get to the final value. And the timestamp I haven't mentioned, that's an H-based thing or a big table thing. Every cell is actually versioned. So in my, in my example there, let's just start with a simple one, uh, say, for key 12, uh, column 2A had the value 3. So we look here, 12, uh, where we 2A, and you find the value 3. In the final one here, uh, perhaps that used to have a different value, Fred, but with the newest timestamp, we've updated it to Q. That's actually the same cell, but a different time. Um, and so you don't have to use it, but um, it's quite a handy, handy feature of to, to have built in if you want versioned data. Um, so whizzing on through this, the other thing is partitioning in a column-oriented database. Uh, OK, this is how you almost always partition data is by row. Every uh, relational database has partitioning and whatever. All these other things, they partition by row and start sharding out to different servers. In a column-oriented one, you might consider doing it by column. Because actually, the advantage of a column is, uh, is that it's got similar types of data, maybe all URLs or all numeric data or whatever. They can compress together. They can be scanned in a similar way. So just to wrap up on these, um, HBase and Cassandra are the best known. Uh, Hypertable is very similar. Again, it's a C++ uh, implementation of more or less the same as HBase. Um, so with the column-oriented tables, the column-oriented uh, databases, the, the compression, uh, sorry, sorry they, they're very good for things like compression or searching by column. If you want to know everything ha that happened today, uh, you know, total of sales, I mean, that's a kind of naff example. You're more interested in totaling your sales by all the sales rather than looking at rows like what did one particular user do. They're quite a good solution. They're actually not as good on the flexible schema thing as Con Mongo, Couch. Um, you really need to do some work up front to work out what your schema is, which is kind of back to where you were with relational. Um, so a little bit on HBase and Cassandra. HBase was started by Apache as part of the Hadoop thing. It's the Hadoop database. Uh, and it actually doesn't implement a lot of stuff itself. It just delegates it all to HDFS. Um, Cassandra is slightly more influenced by um, Apache Dynamo uh, rather than Google Bigtable. 
but it, also the other big difference is it doesn't need any of this Apache stuff, so it's, there's less overhead uh, sysadmin work to get it started up, I guess. Um, whizzing on to graph databases. I haven't got as much to say about this because, frankly, I'm not as, as certain about this stuff. But basically, uh, Neo4j is, is the main player in the space. The idea of a graph database is um, if you think of a whiteboard and you start drawing circles on your whiteboard and lines in between them, then, at, um, then that's what you model in a graph database. So, you know, that's a, a graph. Um, and so you actually think about the nodes being the things and the lines between them. And, and the, the edges, the connections between them can actually have their own attributes. So a good example of this, if you think about IMDB, um, it, the, the Internet Movie Database, it's got um, lots of films and other similar things, and it's got actors, directors, producers, and so forth, or people, I think you could say, because someone who is an actor in one film might have directed the next film, so you can actually start building up quite a complex pattern of you can store all your people and all your films and then start looking at the connections between them. Um, so the, the, a good example I saw of this is the Kevin Bacon game. I don't know if you know that, sort of how many degrees away from Kevin Bacon any given actor is in terms of Kevin Bacon acted in a film with somebody, that somebody acted in another film with somebody else and then you get to the person you were thinking of. Um, you, can just do, you can just wipe the floor with that problem in, in Neo, uh, because you can just sort of say, I want the query for everyone who's six degrees away, or less. Um, and, and so that's, that's good. The, the disadvantage is it's quite a complex way of thinking about it. I mean, it sounds good. We take the diagram straight off the whiteboard and put it into the database. Um, but actually, there's a certain simplicity about even the relational thing of we've got tables with rows and stuff. Um, and so the, the query language for this, this is why I haven't got into it quite enough yet, but the query language looks a bit complicated. And um, I think the modeling requires a bit of thinking about it's not your f that you're fixed with the schema, but you just have to, it, it's a bit of a, um, a thing you have to learn as opposed to you know, key value, give it a key, get a value. I mean. How hard can it be? Um, uh, I think that's about all there is to say about that one. Neo is the, I say the main player. There are other players in the space, but I can't honestly remember one right now. <laughs> um, so just to wrap up, um, things were at the Pearl Conference. Uh, Pearl is sadly not, I suppose, as buzzwordy as some languages. So. Um, it, it doesn't tend to be the first thing where people write support. Where they have um, embedded products, like Neo, for example, is, a, um, is an embedded Java product primarily. It's got a REST inf interface and so on. But obviously, if something is designed to be running inside a Java process, then your best way of accessing it is to run it inside a Java process and write code in Java or even JRuby, Scala, what have you. Um, most of these products will have things like REST interfaces and stuff, which is, is OK. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you get the best speed. Um, looking at CPAN, um, I, I sort of did a scan of, of CPAN. The, it seems like, roughly speaking, the key value stores will have a CPAN module. The document stores do. Um, Cassandra does. That's one of the columnar ones, of course. Um, because it has a thrift-based client, so in fact, uh, Leon, who's uh, array arranging stuff here, uh, did a client for that. Uh, but for the other column and graph databases, I don't think, unless I've overlooked it, there's no sort of raw modules for dealing with those, I guess because they're complex. I quite fancy having a go at the Neo, but I'm not signing up for a timetable. Um, and some of them have comments at the top, like say, you know, this did enough for me. Uh, I will get around to filling in the rest of the functionality later, and obviously nobody has, so, yeah. Uh, but some of the frameworks, like the Catalyst and, and so on, basically any framework that has persistence layers, a lot of those will have started putting in persistence to these 
Because if you are doing, you know, like Kyoku, saving objects to a database, it's a dead easy way to save objects is to put it into Couch or something like that. Where, where NoSQL actually is, is it all hype, is the bottom line. I don't think it is, actually. I think unlike XML databases, I think that there's actually some mileage in this one. Um, probably not all of them will last because a lot of them are all really quite similar, but if the market's big enough, it could, uh, they could all keep going. Um, I, things are changing rapidly, and I think there'll be quite a bit of convergence because if you've got a feature-rich database, you're looking, you might look to compete by improving the performance, and if you've got a fast-performing database, you think, well, I'll add a few more features, and they're all going to eventually start coming together. Um, it would be nice to, and I think, yeah, native clients, like a lot of them are using the REST APIs and so on, but if, if you want to improve performance, well, you say, well, there's this alternative native API that goes over, over the wire, um, and that, that might get you a couple of milliseconds. Should you use it? Well, the, the main differences between these are implementation factors, like, okay, you might get excited about the, the, the theory, theoretical differences between Mongo and Couch, but in fact, the biggest difference of those are gonna be down to the exact details of your, how much you're writing versus how much you're reading, how you're sharding, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you, uh, benchmarking is, is kind of, or re looking at these things with your own use case in mind is essential. Um, and as I said at the start, really, the, the, the whole point of this is not to tie everyone into a new single paradigm. Relational has been the single paradigm for the last um, 30, 40 years. Uh, the idea is now you don't have to pick a single winner. So store all your stuff in Mongo and then extract it into uh, Neo for analysis of the connections between them or um, stick Redis or React in front for a bit of caching to, to speed things up. Uh, there is the other option, which is um, if you're already heavily into the relational world, I mean, they all implement XML stores these days. XML is ugly, but you know, it's, it's only JSON with more pointy brackets. Um, uh, PostgreSQL has, has the HStore column, which is basically a hash in a single column. Uh, and that might uh, as well keep your, uh, your data fascist uh, in the DBA department on side. To find out more, there's this quite good book actually which came out since I wrote this talk, but I modified the talk a bit uh, to match. Um, so I, I quite recommend that. I'm working my way through it myself. But um, um, it, it covers PostgreSQL as a relational uh, Mongo and Couch, React and Redis, uh, and what's um, <laughs> Neo and HBase, I guess. So that that's a good survey in slightly more depth than I can cover in 40 minutes. You, there's a lot of books which are literally in the process of being written. There's a, some out already on Couch and Mongo, uh, but uh, Manning, for example, have got quite a lot in their sort of early access program about just about all these. They're obviously trying to just cover the, the whole range. Um, skills Matter is more helpful if you're in London than anywhere else, but uh, Skills Matter is a training company. They do these free evening talks, um, but they actually put the videos online afterwards. So you, you can check out their website and find some interesting talks about uh, various of these things there. And I mean, Wikipedia in the way, but where else would you find, uh, find information these days? So um, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Stunned you all into silence. <laughs> um, right. Well, that's it then. Thank you. Thank you.